Hello and welcome. You're watching To The Point. Not surprisingly, the Kulbhushan Jadav story not only dominates today's papers, but also proceedings in both houses of parliament. Pakistan claims he's a RNAW agent intending to carry out sabotage activities in Balochistan. India says he's a retired naval officer turned businessman who was kidnapped in Iran and abducted to Pakistan. That is the big issue we're going to inquire today and we're going to look into the mysterious questions that surround this otherwise intriguing and so far far from explained story. I'm joined now by former Foreign Secretary Krishnan Srinivasan, former head of RNAW AS Dullath and former Special Secretary of RNAW Rana Banerjee. Mr. Dullath, let me start with a series of questions about Pakistan's handling of Kulbhushan Jadav before we come to some intriguing questions about the Indian government's version. After the 3rd of March 2016 last year, when it became public that Kulbhushan Jadav was in Pakistan's custody, India asked for consular access 13 times and there was no response whatsoever from Pakistan. Now, as someone who's been head of RNAW, how serious a breach of the Vienna Protocol on Consular Relations is this? Well, I guess it is a breach, but you know, if you've got um, a spy with you, why they made it public so quickly and why they were in such a hurry, probably they had a lot of talking to do to him before they, they wanted us to, uh, to get access. Now, whether the gentleman is a spy or not, um, is, um, we don't know. But presuming uh, he was a spy, I, I think they would probably want to, you know, do a lot more interrogation, debriefing, whatever you call it. And uh, they were in a hurry to gain publicity, so they put him up on TV and uh, made him read out, uh, you know, a confession, uh, which was obviously uh, doctored or handed to him. And since then, uh, we haven't been allowed consular access, although now I'm told that uh, after announcing... Uh, uh, well, the I'll come to that, that in a moment, Sam Gulatsab. I'm stopping the you there. I want been, to ask you a question. Uh, you referred two, three times to the possibility this okay. man could be a spy. As you said, we don't know for sure. Is there some clause which says that consular access in the case of someone who's deemed to be a spy or detained for reasons of terror can be denied or does not need to be automatically given? Is there an exception for that? No, no, not at all. In fact, uh, he should, we should have been uh, given consular access and what I'm trying to say is that the whole case was handled a bit sloppily in a hurry by, by Pakistan to gain publicity and uh, therefore, you know, before they had got the whole story from uh, the gentleman, whatever story it was, uh, they wanted to put him out on, on television and okay. handed him, a, uh, as I say, a confession. Mr. So Banerjee, the Dimash issue. Uh, I'll come to you in a moment's time, Gulat Sahib. I'll come to you in a moment's time. Mr. Banerjee, the Dimash issued by the Indian Ministry of External Affairs yesterday points out that the Indian High Commission in Pakistan was not even informed that Sri Jadav was being brought to trial. As you understand the situation, does the Pakistan government have a duty to inform the Indian High Commission that an Indian citizen is about to be tried? Or again, can one argue that? Because he's being tried for spying and terror, there is an exception. Yeah, there is no accepted convention in this regard, particularly because he's being tried in the Army Act, uh, the special powers that have been given to try terrorists. So if he's deemed a terrorist, uh, they need not inform, even if he is a citizen of some other country. Ah, this is a very important point you're making. So the exception the Indian side has taken in their Dimash, where they've objected to the fact he was tried without being informed that is a normal thing in the case of people tried for terror or tried for spying. Well, uh, the legal, exact legal position, uh, I wouldn't know. But uh, the thing is that uh, they have done it. So, some time back, Bajwa had visited uh, the border areas where he had mentioned to the troops that he would be uh, taking the Jadhav case to its logical conclusion. And then again, he has been under some pressure from his own peer group of generals. But, for, uh, but, but the important point you're making is that there is no compulsion or necessity to inform the Indian High Commission that an Indian citizen has been tried. They can go ahead with the trial without informing the Indians. Yes, I would think so. That's a very important point you're making. Uh, I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Dullat. Today's Indian Express says 
that the Jazav trial was a rushed trial lasting hours, just hours. Secondly, we know that in December 2016, just four months ago, Sartaj Aziz reportedly told the Pakistan Senate that the material Pakistan had against Jadav was insufficient, although later Aziz did say he was biscoated, he never said anything of the sort. Most importantly, today our Foreign Minister Mrs. Suraj told the Rajya Sabha that three hours after the death sentence was passed, the Indian High Commission received a request from the Pakistani Foreign Office effectively asking for assistance investigating the Jadav case. They had made consular access conditional to Indian assistance and what they did three hours after the judgment was passed was to write to the Indian side repeating and reiterating the conditional consular access which means that's another way of asking for assistance. Does all of that put together suggest that this was a kangaroo court? that they didn't have the evidence, that they even half admit they don't, and yet they found the man guilty and sentenced him to death. Well, again, like I said, uh, as they did to start with, again, it's been handled sloppily. It's quite bizarre, the whole thing. And then you hand out a, you know, a death sentence to a man, whatever, the, whatever kind of trial you've had or not had, because this is an army court. And uh, in Pakistan, anybody can be hanged. I mean, after all, Bhutto was hanged. The, the, the question really is that, you know, in case the gentleman involved was a spy, this is hardly the way to deal with it. You know, uh, I'm in, between civilized countries, there is a lot of give and take between the agencies. And you know how to do this. You, you, you can ask for one, you can give one. And it's done quietly. It's not given so much publicity, and you don't say that you're going to hang somebody, but and uh, then say that give us evidence. Mr. And, Dullak, uh, and, uh, can I you interrupt? Might have consular access. There's it, it, something the very. Can, is, can I interrupt, Mr. Dullak? Your yeah. answer began yeah. with the possibility that this man could be a spy. Yeah, please. You are therefore, as a former head of RNAW, at least theoretically prepared to accept yeah, of course, he could of be course a spy. He could be a spy. Of course, th this, is, this is regular business. I mean, it happens all over the world. Why would we want to deny that he can't be a spy? He may be a spy. You know, th this is, the, this, as they say, the second oldest profession. It happens all the time. Except That's a big the, deal. The position you're taking but yeah, you know, to make is him the out diametric to be a opposite by of the no position taken of by the Indian government. Could, could he have been a terrorist? Well, just a moment. The point I'm making is this, your position is diametrically that, no. the opposite of the Indian government. You are theoretically prepared as a former head of RNAW to accept he was a spy. The government is not prepared to accept that in any shape and form. I'm saying he could be a spy, yeah, he could be a spy. I'm not saying he is a spy, but I'm saying he could be a spy. Because these things, as I say, happen all the time. All right, that's a very important point and you're making. And this should have been handled much more quietly, I'll come back. Discreetly. I'll come back to the case that suggests that Jadav could be a spy in a moment's time. I'm now joined by Krishnan Srinivasan, the former foreign secretary, who is, I believe, an expert on this whole business of consular access. So let me put that issue to you, Mr. Srinivasan. You weren't with us when we began, so I had to put it to others. But now that you're with us, I want to repeat it. After the 3rd of March 2016, when it became known publicly that Kulbhushan Jadav was in Pakistan's custody, India asked for consular access 13 times and there was no response granting access, although the Pakistanis did offer some form of conditional access, which never happened. So for 13 times we asked for it and it wasn't granted. In your eyes, how serious a breach of the Vienna Protocol is that? Well, uh, the Vienna uh, Convention on Consular Relations, let's call it VCCR, that's how it's known, um, provides for um, consular access, cons firstly intimation to the country concerned and consular access um, within reasonable limits to in any circumstances, either criminal or uh, whether it's an immigration problem or whether it's anything else, uh, a, a civil suit. So um, consular access is a part of 
this convention which has been signed both by India and Pakistan. However, uh, you know, the, uh, the country which is holding the, the prisoner uh, can certainly um, restrict this uh, with, within reasonable circumstances. Uh, you know, the access cannot be out of office hours, it may not be mm. necessarily personal, but it can be by telephone, etc. There are many shades of, uh, of dealing with this. But in this case, as I understand it, despite repeated requests by India, Pakistan is not given access at all. And that, of course, is a breach of the convention, but more, more importantly, it's a reflection of tremendous uh, bad faith on the part of Pakistan. Can, can or I you stop with that? Mr. Uh, a, a feeling of guilt that they actually well, well, do let's not, not have. Let's not speculate okay. about what feelings of guilt on the Pakistan side may have stopped them because we don't know. Let me ask you another technical question. Does the Vienna Protocol okay. lay down how quickly consular access is granted once it's been asked for? Or is that a grey area? Can Pakistan take its time? It does, the VCCR does not stipulate any time frame, but on the other hand, it is implied that it should be practically immediate as soon as the consular officer can reach the, the spot where the, um, the prisoner is being held. Uh, of course, this is not always possible because the consular office may be in a distant location in a big country. But yes, the implication is that it is more or less immediate. But of course, you know, it has been uh, observed in the breach by many countries, particularly countries with an autocratic disposition. What about India? How good is our track record? Take, for example, the Purulia arms drop case. How good was our track record at that time in granting consular access? Well, I, you know, I have no personal knowledge of this. I can only say that uh, the uh, MEA website, uh, you know, provides the telephone numbers and the person to contact in terms of consular access. And uh, I think in terms of uh, observing the VCCR, I think India is compliant. So India is compliant. And as you said, it is unexceptional and probably unacceptable for Pakistan to refuse 13 requests over a one year period. Is that a yes from you, Mr. Srinivasan? Uh, certainly it's unreasonable. It's an, it's a, it is a yes. Let's then come, Mr. Banerjee, to some of the intriguing questions and mystery from the Indian point of view. We've gone through the intriguing questions from the Pakistan point of view that surround the Kulbhushan Jadav case. And perhaps this is one reason why someone like Mr. Dullot, the former head of RNAW, is prepared to theoretically accept Mr. Jadav could be a spy. The first thing is this. If he was legitimately working as a retired naval officer turned businessman in Chabahar, which is what the Indian government position is, why was he carrying an Indian passport with a false name Hussein Mubarak Patel, which was first issued to him, I believe, in 2003 and recently renewed as recently as 2014? Well, <clears throat> it is very obvious that he would have had to take the name of a Muslim Shia for being able to carry out a normal business while he was based in Chabahar. Otherwise, it would have been difficult for him to function as a Hindu trader based in Chabahar. That is how I would uh, think he thought it prudent to manage to get this type of a passport. The second so he, reason so he could have adopted a Muslim name. That's right. Because without a Shia identity, yes. he couldn't have got a job in Chabahar. Yes. The other reason has been hinted also in the report today in Indian, Indian Express, Praveen Swami's report, that there may have been a person, real person by that name, who would have already got visas and then. Uh, somehow in duplicate passport making his name was ju juxtaposed with the picture of Kulbush. But then that's even more strange and mysterious because that second explanation suggests he's impersonating someone who no longer lives. Well, in getting a hold of a fa false passport, these type of things happen easier than we believe because it's a question of bribing local officials and things like that. So he would have bribed a local official to get a passport either impersonating someone who's dead or taking on a new name and a false name. But it would have happened by bribery. It's possible that it Is could it have. possible 
that perhaps there is some level of intelligence complicity. Because it would suit an intelligence agency to give this man a second name, to facilitate him getting into Chabahar, and they may have helped him. It's plausible, but... Uh, it's I plausible. Would, I wouldn't know about it. Yes. But it's plausible. Yes, sir. One more question about that. The Times of India today reveals that, in fact, this same man also rented since 2007 his mother Avanti's flat in Mumbai under the name Hussain Mubarak Patel. Now, if he needed that name Hussain Mubarak Patel to go to Chabahar because he needed a Shia identity to work in Iran, why did he need a Shia identity to rent his mother's flat? Again, this would be pertaining to the verifications that maybe were being done from the Iranian side to, to ascertain the veracity of his antecedents. Let me bring you in at that point, Mr. Dulak. You're the one who first said <coughs> theoretically it's possible this man could be a spy. I've just discussed with Mr. Banerjee the fact that since 2003, Kulbushan Jadav had an Indian passport in the name of Hussein Mubarak Patel. It was renewed as recently as 2014. And separately, the Times of India has said since 2007, he's rented his own mother's flat in Bombay under that false name Hussein Mubarak Patel. Does all of that suggest that there's more to this story and this is one reason why you feel he could be a spy? Oh yeah, I'm saying he could be a spy because of the fact that, uh, you know, these things do happen. It's, it's not something which is happening for the first time. And in any case, I, while I go along with what my colleague Rana has said about, you know, uh, getting a, a passport, paying for a passport under a false name, I think it's uh, rather far-fetched to, to think that the Iranians, if they wanted or not wanted to give him a job, would be making inquiries about him in Mumbai. Uh, you know, I, for that, I, m I must say, the Iranians would require a very elaborate uh, uh, system to go about. So, so, so are you, you suggesting... Know, the thing is, let us, let us say that... What is the worst case? Yeah. Are you therefore suggesting the fact that he has see, this what is the second worst case passport scenario? with the a best, false name? Best from our point of view is that the whole thing, this whole thing is a fraud. When you say this whole thing is a fraud, you mean there is more to this see, story? We say he was not a spy. Obviously, we, we are going to deny it. There could be more to it or there could be less to it. In any case, the point is that, you know, when something is made public uh, to the extent that the Pakistanis made it, we are obviously, even if he was a spy, we are going to deny it. We are not going to say, yes, yes, of course, he's our man and please send him back. That's what I'm saying. It's all been sloppily handled. This should not, never have been made public. It should have been okay. dealt with agency to agency. And since the agencies do not have a relationship, it should have been dealt with by one NSA with the other. Quite right, sir. Whom but, but, but let's not, let's not get into how it should have been dealt, because that's now speculative. It hasn't been dealt that way. But the point you've confirmed is the fact that this man has double identities. He has a passport with a Muslim name, that he even rented his mother's flat in a Muslim name. All of that suggests that there is more to it, that he could have been the work or he could have been involved in some sort of intelligence agency operation, that would have explained this. Is that a yes from you, Mr. Dulat? Could have been. Could have been. All Could right, that's been, very yeah. important. Could have been. Let me bring you in, Krishina Vasan. There's another element here that is intriguing. The Indian Dimash says Kulbushan Jadav was kidnapped last year from Iran. But if the Pakistanis kidnapped him, and let's for a moment accept that, if they kidnapped him, doesn't that raise the question, what was so special about him that made the Pakistanis want to kidnap him? I presume they wouldn't kidnap and abduct a man without good reason to do so. Don't we need to ask that question? Because if we do believe he was kidnapped, then we have to ask, why was he kidnapped? What does he have? What does he know that would make the Pakistanis want to kidnap him? Well, yes, I mean, that's another aspect which is completely opaque. 
um, uh, 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 if he was kidnapped, actually who kidnapped him? Because uh, there is a report, as you know, that uh, says that um, he was actually kidnapped by the Taliban and then handed over to the ISI of Pakistan. There are just too many versions and it's impossible really to separate the truth from these various uh, uh, clouds of ambiguity that surround this whole case. In fact, Why would the Pakistanis have, uh, have taken the trouble of abducting him from a friendly country like Iran, friendly to Pakistan and to India? That is, that is quite uh, beyond uh, my capacity to answer. Can I, can I stop you? If he was kidnapped uh, can I stop from you? Iran, Iran also has some answers to give. Can I ask you this? A former German ambassador to Pakistan, a gentleman called Gunther Mulak, said last year that he had information that Kulbushan Jadav had been kidnapped by the Taliban inside Iran and sold to Pakistan's ISI. Now, do you believe that is a story the Indian Foreign Office should have investigated into? And if they did, would they not have revealed what more Mr. Mulak had told them? Because up till now, after this story appeared in the papers almost a year ago, there's been no reportage or news of any follow-up from the Indian Foreign Ministry and no information about what this gentleman told the Indian Foreign Office. So isn't that intriguing too? Yeah, completely. I mean, the whole thing is so opaque that uh, really it's uh, uh, honestly almost farcical. Uh, if the German indeed had said that, I would have expected the uh, Indian government immediately to to find out more about this and indeed find out more about the from the German diplomat and indeed from Iran because Iran then becomes uh, willy-nilly a party to this uh, this tripartite problem one other but, thing uh, to go back to your original point I, I, I really do not understand well, what is it you don't understand please finish Uh, I, I don't understand, uh, as you said, uh, why Pakistan would have abducted this particular person from that particular place um, and uh, kept him for a year uh, before before making any um, taking any steps to okay. to accuse him of anything. One other question: If Kulbhushan Jadav had been abducted from Chabahar, which I believe is what the government's position is. And remember, Chabahar is where we are building a high-profile port for the Iranians. Do you believe that the Indian government would have complained to the Iranians, why are you permitting Indian citizens lawfully working in your country on a high-profile port that we are building for you to be abducted and kidnapped by the Pakistanis? And if it was natural for the Indians to protest, then would Definitely, we not have found I, out about it? I, I, would they not have revealed details? Because again, I've the, seen nothing no, in the papers. The, 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 yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you entirely. I think the Iranians would have some answers to give. And none of those answers are available to us. Let me put this to you. There are several elements of this story from the Indian side which are bewildering and mysterious. Why did he have this second passport since 2003? Why was he renting his mother's flat in a false name? Was he kidnapped? If he was kidnapped, why was he kidnapped? Did we follow up on the German ambassador's story? Did we complain to the Iranians? Your colleague, a former head of RNAW, believes that all of this is one reason why this gentleman could be a spy. You, you see, Give me a second opinion. You see, we have to appreciate that he, he, he was working in operating dhaus and he had a dhau of his own by the name of Kaminda. Now that's not really the same thing as working in constructing construction activities at Chabahar port. So it's a more freelance commercial activity of his own. Uh, he may be bringing some goods which or carrying some goods which may not be uh, completely approved by the Iranian authorities. That is one aspect. The other, some form of smuggling or it contraband. It could have been. It could have been. Secondly, that you also suggested that he's not completely on board if he's doing that. Well, you know. Again, another thing is that he spoke to his relatives in Marathi and no agent who's sort of been professionally trained would do that in violation of, you know, strict security regulations. So there are a lot of questions. So he was careless. Master. He was careless about that. Then when he but, was but, apprehended, uh, how could the passport be found on his person unless he was abducted? So all these things would suggest 
that he may have been trapped in some manner or uh, abducted. Also, when trapped Hassan, in some Hassan, manner would suggest that he made a lapse as an he agent. He made a lapse, of course, of secure. And also, Hassan Rouhani was in Pakistan when the case was announced, and he was upset that, uh, and he denied in a press conference that Iran had anything to do with this. Uh, uh, so know, the questions uh, surrounding this case grow. Sir. The answers are the difficult ones to be sure about. And as the questions grow, our sense of mystery also grows. One last question, Mr. Dulat, and then I have to take a break. The most intriguing development is that Jadav's trial and sentencing happened shortly after news emerged that a Pakistani intelligence agent called Lieutenant Colonel Muhammad Habib Zahir had gone missing in Lumbini, where apparently he'd been lured with the offer of a job and apparently Pakistani media claims he was going to be paid an astonishing $8,500 a month. The Pakistani media is convinced that Colonel Zahir has been trapped by RNAW. And my question is simple. Could this be a tit-for-tat operation that ends up with Jadav and Zahir being exchanged? <laughs> well, that would be the simplest uh, solution to this whole thing. But I haven't heard this uh, story or I don't know the full facts of this story and I've only vaguely come across it. But, uh, you know, all these things, uh, like um, Rana said, they are mysterious, they are opaque, they are murky, and uh, the full facts were, might never be known. You mean we may never know the truth about Kulbhushan Jadav? Do you really mean that, Mr. Dulat? But, you know, the first thing which struck me, I, I mean that, uh, the first thing that struck me yesterday, like you're suggesting, that why is Pakistan doing this at this point of time? What is the point they're trying to prove? And that could link up so with Colonel Zaheer. The it could yourself. link up I with Colonel Zaheer disappearing, and Pakistan may have deliberately expedited the trial of Jadav <laughs> so that they have an exchange in hand for Zaheer. That's one speculation. It's there in the Pakistan media today. It's also on social media in India. I don't know. I don't know Zaheer. I don't know who Zaheer is. Okay, then since you don't know, I'll go very yeah, quickly yeah, to Mr. Possibly, Banerjee. Whatever. You know the story, Mr. Dullah didn't. Do you think it's possible or plausible that this is going to lead to an exchange? Well, it's early days. I mean, the story is possible. It could happen. It may not ha have happened. It may be a uh, Anything false Anything is plausible. Flag. I'm afraid yes. I've got to end this there. We've yeah. got Farooq Abdullah waiting for us the other side of the break. But what I want to sum up by saying that I've had three experts a former head of RNAW, a former foreign secretary, and a former special secretary of RNAW, and they've all answered in a way to suggest that the questions that surround the Kulbhushan Jadav story add to the mystery. It's opaque. We don't have answers. We have lots and lots of questions. And as Mr. Dullat said, a former head of RNAW, it could be that this gentleman is a spy. But he also said we may never know the full story. This is a fascinating story. The less you know, the more you want to. We're going to take a break at that point, and then I'll be joined by the former Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Farooq Abdullah, President of the National Conference Party, and one of the candidates that many believe is likely to win the Srinagar by-election. But the big question mark is after the Anantnag by-election has been postponed, what will be the future of the election that Dr. Abdullah fought on Sunday? Join me immediately after the break to hear him speak exclusively on that key issue. The point. On Sunday, the Srinagar by-election saw a dismal 7% turnout, 8 deaths and nearly 300 injuries. Last night, the Anantanag by-election scheduled for tomorrow was postponed, but we still don't know what would happen to the Srinagar by-election. Officially, re-polling in some 20 or 30 polling booths is scheduled for the 13th. But will the election be scrapped? Joining me to discuss this issue and to address this problem is the President of the National Conference and former Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Farooq Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah is one of the leading candidates in that by-election that took place on Sunday at Srinagar. Dr. Abdullah, as I said, late last night, the Election Commission postponed the Anantalag Lok Sabha by-election to the 25th of May. Do you believe that the Srinagar by-election held on Sunday, where you were a leading candidate, where eight people were killed, perhaps 300 injured, perhaps over a hundred polling booths damaged, should be scrapped and held again? Uh, 
You see, it's a question of uh, scrapping is a different matter. Point is, we had already informed the government that the conditions are not conducive to hold election. They didn't listen to us. They said, no, we are going to go through. Yes, sir, but that's now history. And on top of it, look at the results. But, sir, that's what We had I similar elections in 2014 when the percentage was over 29%. In these two years, it has come to 6%. But, but Dr. Abdullah, I'm interrupting I you. This government has Dr. Abdullah, I'm interrupting you on purpose because let's not go back to what you said before the polling was held. The situation now is a different one. You've had a dismal day on Sunday, as a result of which Anantanag has been postponed. Should the voting that happened on Sunday in Srinagar be honored and the count tallied and a victor declared, or should Anantana accept the precedent and the polling in Srinagar be scrapped and a new date set for new polling? Tell me about that. I don't know what election commission will do. It's for election commission to decide. Let them decide what they want to do. But what do you think should happen? Well, You're as far a candidate. As my party's decision will be, we'll take that decision when we meet. But I'm a candidate, but I'm a candidate of a party, not an individual. I, I represent a party. It will be the party I the party. which will sit and decide what we have to do. But you're the president of the party. And remember... It doesn't make any difference. It's not an uh, autocratic uh, thing. It's not a dictatorship. It's not a dictatorship, Karan. It's a democratic party. But let me In put that, this... it is the majority that decides. Dr. Abdullah, let committee. me put this to you. You don't have time on your side. The repolling happens on meet, the 13th, which is day after tomorrow. And on the 15th, the, election, the counting will happen. So you've got roughly, roughly four days in hand to decide. Will you How as a party matter? decide in Results four days? Results will come out. The result will come out. We will decide after the result comes out what action we are going to take. You mean you will decide after the result comes out whether you want to accept the result as Did a credible you get that? result? Yes, exactly. The party will meet and then we'll decide. Don't jump the gun. Let me put it like this. As of today, after the violence, the deaths and the extremely poor turnout, do you believe that the result can be credible? What is credible? What do you call credible? People died. Young people died. Still, with all that pressure, our workers came out. They exercised their franchise with all those difficulties. Don't forget that part of it. I'm not, sir. With all the pressure on them. No, but... Their life in their hands. I understand. They went to the polling booth. I understand, Dr. Abdullah, that Don't your workers... That part of it. ...put their lives in their hands to campaign and man the polling booths. But my question is a slightly different one. With a turnout of just 7.14%, the lowest ever, can the victor, whether it's you or your opponent, can the victor claim to represent the constituency? After all... 93% of people didn't bother to show up at the booth at all. the government of the day. Uh, why, how could they come? With all the pressures on them, would they be able to come? Let us throw at their houses. We'll burn you down. But, but Did you see that? But that's why I asked Dr. Did you Abdullah? see grenades being thrown in the night Dr. on my Abdullah. party workers' homes? But that's why I asked the question. Can the victor, the whoever will be the victor is, claim by to the represent the constituency when the only 7% voted? Out. I mean, what is... Can this be credible? 7% voted, 93% didn't bother to show up, whatever the reason. Can the victor call claim to represent anyone? I don't know what anyone? you don't call credible. Karan... What are you wanting to say? That Farooq Abdullah should now say, I resign? I belong to a democratic party. The party will decide 
post results when we meet what we are going to do. Don't ask me to say anything more than that. Is it possible that even if you win, your party could decide that this is not an election that gives anyone a mandate and if Anantanag is held again, you want this to be held again? Is it possible that even if you win, they could come to that conclusion? Well, let's see. Let's see. I, w I can't say any of these things till the party meets and they decide. Let me put something else to you, Dr. Abdullah. We we'll leave that to the party. Let me put something else. Repeatedly in the past, when elections in the valley have recorded impressive turnouts, the Indian state has claimed that Kashmiris are embracing India, that the situation is close to normal. Now, by that same logic, when the turnout is just 7.14%, isn't this a clear vote of no confidence both in Srinagar and Delhi? Yes, it is. There is no doubt about it. It is a vote against them. Definitely the turnout being so low after so many years of good elections shows that in these two years the situation is getting graver and graver and graver. Even the parliamentary delegation that went two years ago, they said at that time we should talk to all stakeholders, find a way forward. And that Nothing didn't happen. Moved. Nothing has been done. Let me so ask this you this. The process Dr. of Abdullah, alienation has grown and it continues to grow. That's the question I want to ask. As you say, the alienation has yes. grown and it continues to grow. Now, Anantanag has been postponed to the 25th of May in the hope that the situation will be more conducive. Is it really likely that a postponement of six no, weeks will see a change? I think it has been postponed because they knew fully well that their candidate is going to lose. And they did not want to see their candidate lose. Now, given the fact that the Mehbooba Mufti government has been unable to create a conducive atmosphere for polls, which is, I believe, a duty the government has, do you think the government should be dismissed and President's rule brought in? I think that is the right way forward. The problem, Dr. Abdullah, is that President's rule would mean direct rule by Delhi, and that means direct rule by Mr. Modi and the BJP. Do you want that as well? So, even today, it's not, it's not a question of direct rule. There is indirect rule today. It will be good if it's a direct rule. So you are ready for President's rule and direct rule by Mr. Modi and the BJP government in Delhi. Have I understood correctly? Why not? We will see for very clearly whether they are ready to give us peace or not. If they don't, the situation will be further deteriorating and the situation will be so grave I wonder what will happen at the end of the day. You believe Kashmir is heading towards some sort of disaster, a political disaster? Yes, it is heading towards political disaster. Yes, definitely. Those are very strong. God help us all. Those are very strong and serious words emphasized further by that last phrase, God help us all, as if to say only God can help us. But the question it raises is, is God willing to do so? Unfortunately, it's not a question I have time to ask. But this has been certainly a depressing interview. And the most important thing is that the National Conference as a party itself will decide when the results of the Srinagar election are known, whether they wish to accept them as credible or whether they wish the example of Anantanag to be followed and for a new poll to be ordered in Srinagar. As Dr. Abdullah says, it's possible that that could be the outcome. That even if he wins, his party may decide the result is not credible and they want the example of Anantna to be followed. We'll know in five days' time. And there we end tonight's show. If you have done, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Good night.